Binder. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, the beginnings of sequencing for studying microbes, basically. Not quite the beginning, but um, the first real revolution, what I'm calling era one, which is using sequencing to build a tree of life. Um, experimenting with using my phone as a remote here. Um, so, um, and we'll spend a few lectures, a few classes talking about sort of phylogeny um, and the tree of life before moving on to the next eras. Um, and so next class, we're going to spend the whole class talking about phylogenetic methods. And that's what's basically covered in that Baldos paper um, and hinted at in uh, the Fox et al. paper. And um, then you know that's the, the phylogenetic methods are going to be integral to a lot of the tools that we talk about, a lot of the analysis of sequence data required to understand these phylogenetic methods. Um, if I don't screw this up too badly. Um, so these are the two papers that I really wanted to talk about today. Um, they were both published in 1977. Uh, they sort of led to um, a complete revolution in thinking about microbes and microbial diversity and phylogeny. I think um, when this first one came out, which came out later than this one, um, I think it was covered like you know front page in the New York Times and lots of other big news stories. This was a big, uh, big, big deal. What was in that paper? So we're going to focus on this paper at least for now. So did people? have major questions about these papers? Did you understand sort of the basic point of conclusions of them? What parts of them did you not understand? Yeah? I couldn't understand the second two persons that um, well, about logic. Yeah. Like distance or not. Yeah. Okay. So we'll get to that at, at, at the end of today and tomorrow. Anything, yeah? I about the values that they use in the tables, but not enough to understand Yeah, so the SAV values. Yeah. Anything else? I mean, they're reasonably straightforward in a lot of ways. It's before we get into the, you know, there wasn't a lot of data to analyze. So the, the data analysis part is pretty simple, although they don't really talk about it in detail in the Woese and Fox paper. They refer to like four papers saying this is where the SAV value has come from and all these other things. And then the um, Fox et al. paper talks about it a little bit, but not in you know, detail either and refers to other papers also. Anything else? Yeah. I didn't really get the point of like the Black Sea sample and the other one sample. And I didn't really get what that was for. Yeah, um, yeah there. It, it turns out in the end, none of the details of the organisms or the samples matter. Uh, but we can talk about it. And yeah, there's, they were obsessed about lots of little details about whether or not they could grow things. And there's a lot of, but in the end, it doesn't actually matter. Anything else? Yeah. Um, there was a person who referred to talk about like gram positive and gram negative. All right, so um, we can get to most of these things. And I thought I would just sort of walk through the paper like we've been talking about doing, uh, introduction, methods, results, et cetera, and then we can talk about some of the details. OK, so the Wozen Fox paper has lots of uh, background. It's sort of half the paper is the background. Um, and there's a reason for this, because they're basically proposing rewriting the entire tree of life, right? So they don't make, you know, they don't overemphasize this, but that is, they knew that this was going to be controversial, and they knew that this was going to be somewhat of a big deal. So they really wanted to lead into what they were going to report in this paper. So basically, they go through 
all sorts of things, some of it sort of um, historical, some of it uh, really useful about um, classification of organisms. They focus on classification largely in this paper um, rather than phylogeny, and that, those are different things, right? So classification is basically we take organisms and we sort them into groups, and the way we do classification is a hierarchy, so there's, um, in this case, they're talking about you know the higher level groups, but you go all the way down, kings, clay, chaps, on fine grain, sand, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and then you know a little bit sometimes higher levels. Um, and so a good classification scheme should be based upon the evolutionary relationships of the organism. But they're not the same thing. So they're focusing here not on like exactly the exact structure of an evolutionary tree, they're focusing really on just classification of organisms. So they're going through some of the historical classification of organisms and saying, you know, here's this interesting thing. We have these cells on the planet. And um, when people first started to look at them, they grouped them into, you know, plants and animals. And then when they discovered microorganisms, originally they were classified as plants. And then people realized they weren't plants. We had to build a new classification scheme. And then people started to look at cells, and they came up with this prokaryote, eukaryote distinction, right? You know what that is? That's prokaryote is uh, a name for something based upon the absence of a feature, absence of a nucleus. Eukaryote means you have a nucleus. Um, so that was sort of the classification when they were coming at this. And then there were lower other classifications like gram positive and gram negative, and different groups of prokaryotes and different groups of eukaryotes, but. They're focusing initially on the on the big part, um, and they say, you know, many people thought that this was completely resolved. You divide the living world into these two groups, and then they hinted this um, without going into a lot of detail. This, you know, grouping all organisms that don't have a feature to, together into this prokaryote group is probably not the smartest thing in the world. It's, you know, the absence of a feature doesn't say that things are related to each other. It's like saying, if you look at all vertebrates, saying the absence of flight, we should group organisms by the absence of flight, right? So um, that's just, it's not a great way to build a classification scheme or evolutionary relationships. And, you know, they go into a lot of detail here. So people, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, you know, even without the exact structure of the phylogenetic tree and exactly, you know, understanding where organisms came from, people had come up with this model of eukaryotes being a mix of different lineages. Different prokaryotic lineages somehow merging together to become a eukaryote. So you have these complicated eukaryotes, symbiotic collection of organisms, and then all the other things, the prokaryotes. Is that all sort of familiar? They're just sort of setting the landscape. And they do this in paragraph after paragraph after paragraph in this paper. And it's pretty unusual for a paper to have that much of the paper be dominated by an introduction and background compared to the total length of the paper. That's, I think, pretty unusual. And you know, journal editors these days would probably tell you you can't do that. Or, um, yeah. So, so we'll get to that later when so after they go through all of this work and they figure out that um, prokaryotes might be made up of two, at least two distinct groups, they wanted to come up with new ways of naming things. And they flailed around for a while, um, including eukaryote, including archaebacteria. Um, and now, today, we call them eukaryotes, bacteria, and archaea as the three groups. And the eukaryotes has disappeared basically. So, um, so you know, they go through, um, you know, some of the logic of what they're doing here. You have these, you know, some of it is a little weird, like this stuff about quanta, you know, dividing up groups into quantized parts. Um, and here's the Ur kingdom. Uh, that is the, so, he switched a little bit. The Ur thing is sort of referring to things in the past, the ancestral grouping, and trying to figure out what the, um, you know, 
original cell looked like and was like and hypothesizing that it was prokaryotic and then eukaryotes arose later. But they do say throughout some of their work that we don't actually know that. You know, that's sort of a hypothesis. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot here that I would just ignore um, uh, about complexity of cells and, you know, whether or not things switch between different groups over time. Um, but this is the key part of the introduction. How do you build a tree of life? Well, if you have a classification scheme, and as basically all biologists agree now, this classification scheme should be based upon phylogeny, relatedness of organisms. If you have groups of organisms and you want to build a tree, how do you, how do, you do that? That's what they're getting into here. And what they're saying is basically, you have to have things that you can compare that are equivalent between all the organisms and that are useful for inferring evolutionary relationships. Um, so the kind they don't they don't go into a lot of detail on this, but one of the key points of this is um, what I was saying before is that if you have a cell with a nucleus and all sorts of cell, you know, you have many cells with nuclei, different types of organisms, and many or different types of organisms without nuclei. It's not really a fair comparison. The absence of a feature is not a comparable structure to build an evolutionary tree and say that all these are one branch and all those are another branch. So then they say, but comparative analysis of molecular sequences can be used. This, they're not inventing this from scratch. In 1977, people have been taking sequence data and building evolutionary trees for about 15 to 20 years already from all sorts of different organisms. The approach was sort of pioneered in about 1962 or so by um, a couple people doing this with hemoglobin sequences. And then it sort of spread to using sequence data to build evolutionary trees for all sorts of other organisms. But people had not done it much for comparing across all cellular organisms across the tree of life. Hadn't really done it at all. So we there on this? So that's basically, they're setting this up to say we think there is the possibility of building a tree with all organisms on the planet on this one tree with data that we're compared, we're, it's fair to compare across these organisms. All good? Okay, so then um, another interesting thing about this paper is there's really no new data in the paper. They're taking data that came from other papers. So their methods section is basically um, we're going to compare ribosomal RNA sequences. And here, here's their methods. The primary structure of the 16S ribosomal RNA has been characterized in a moderately large and varied collection of organisms and organelles. And that's their data. <laughs> that's their, their, basically their, most of their methods section. Um, there's one other part to the methods section here. And we'll come back to a little bit of this in a minute. So, um, so Everybody know what is ribosome RNA? You know what ribosomes are, right? Ribosomes are the machines that cells use for translating RNA into proteins. All cellular organisms have ribosomes. And you know, over, you know, we now know all sorts of detail about the ribosomal structure, but at the time, there wasn't a lot of detail known about it, but people knew that ribosomes were made up of proteins and RNA. The RNA in the ribosome is called ribosomal RNA. The proteins are called ribosomal proteins. When people started to look in, started to take those ribosomal RNAs or the ribosomal proteins and start to read their sequences at you know very simple level, they started to realize that they were basically similar to each other across all the organisms on the planet. Um, so you have this data on, on the ribosomes and the ribosome RNA. Oh, I just have a couple of figures. So right, you, you transcribe into RNA, you translate into protein. The translation is done by ribosomes. A little side story that you may or may not know. 
The catalytic activity in the ribosome is actually largely due to RNA rather than proteins. The proteins are sort of a structure, and then the ribosome RNA is also partly a structure, and then they're all organized to have this sort of catalytic activity um, for carrying out, growing the elongating protein chain. And you know, we know lots of detail about this now. They didn't at the time. Um, so you may or may not know ribosomal RNAs fold over into three-dimensional structures. This is a drawing of the two-dimensional structure of, I think, the E. coli ribosomal RNA. So um, once the RNA gets made, it starts to fold over where the base pairing rules, and there actually are extra rules for RNA, allow it to form these what are called stems, and then these are called loops. And so you can have in a stem, you know, A, Remember U in, your, in RNA instead of T, A, U, C, C, and then a loop of like C, G, C, C, A, 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 doesn't matter. And then it comes back and you have G lining up with C, G lining up with C, and A lining up with U, and so on. And that folds over into this structure, and that's what allows them to work in a lot of ways like proteins. They form a specific structure based upon their sequence. So that's not particularly important for what they're doing, but we'll come back to this. The, um, their main point is that you have ribosomal RNAs in all organisms, all cellular organisms, and you can read the sequence of these, although we'll get into how tough that was at the time in a minute. And that you can then compare the sequence of them to each other and take that comparison and build an evolutionary tree or build a classification tree. We're all okay with this? Okay. So they go through in this paper and in the Fox et al. paper uh, some of the logic behind this. Why do they use ribosome RNA? It's universal found in all cellular organisms. It's highly conserved functionally. That's important just because it means it keeps it sort of comparable across all these organisms. It evolves pretty slowly. That's important because you want to be able to compare across organisms that shared a common ancestor three or four billion years ago. So you want to have parts that you're able to compare to each other to make sense out of it. So it's sort of the equivalent of comparing um, skeletons across vertebrates. If the bone structure evolved really rapidly, you wouldn't be able to compare the bones of a bird to the bones of a, you know, a fox. But we, we can. We can line them up. And that's the same deal here. We'll talk about this more when we talk about phylogeny. You want to line up the sequences with each other in what's called a sequence alignment, just like you would line up bones, and then compare them. And that only works really well to study long ago events if what you're looking at evolves slowly. And they say it's easy to extract and sequence, which you know, is painful to see now um, because they basically spent four years to get you know, 30 base pairs of sequence from some of these different organisms. But it was a lot easier than sequencing proteins, and it was a lot easier at the time than sequencing DNA. Yeah? So, are we sequencing if So there are two, so, so inside cells, RNA in many cases is sort of designed in ways to turn over. You don't necessarily want RNAs to stay around for a long period of time. And so um, cells have ways of targeting RNAs for degradation. But for RNAs that you want to stick around for a while, there are ways of protecting them and keeping them around longer. So inside cells, ribosome RNAs last a reasonably period of, reasonable period of time compared to random other RNAs. Um, and that's partly due to these modifications and you know, specific things to protect them from some of the degradation processes. But it's also partly due to the structure. So these structures protect that when, when RNA folds over into like double-stranded RNA, and when it folds over into a package, like a compact you know, structure like this, that protects it from some of the degradation. So this is really important because when you grind up cells and you extract RNA, I don't know if you've ever done this, and you run 
even when you try to get DNA out of cells and you run it out on a gel, you frequently can see three bands on your gel that correspond to the ribosomal RNAs from that organism. The different, they come in different you know, lengths, different sizes. It's pretty stable. So when they were working on this at the time, you grow up a population of cells and you grind them up. Um, if you wanted to work on DNA at the time, it was hard because there was very little of it in total compared to the RNA. There's gobs more ribosome RNA per cell than there is the copy of the gene that encodes the ribosome RNA. So at the time, they would just grind up cells. This is why they said it was easy. You grind up cells, most of what you get out when you do an RNA extraction is ribosomal RNA. And over 10 or so years, they and other people developed methods to get that better and better and better until the point where you could actually do sequencing of them. Any other? OK, so it's easy to ex extract and sequence. And then here's their real result, right? Comparative analysis of this data is summarized in table one. And they say it immediately shows that the organisms clearly cluster into several primary kingdoms. Right, that's the top level of the classification scheme. So here's the data. This is the data for their paper, the results. Isn't it clear? I mean, it, it's just amazing that they just tell you to look at this data matrix of SAB values, which they don't even you know, tell you a lot about, and then say, this is clear when looking at this data matrix that organisms group into multiple primary kingdoms. And I mean, if I was, like, if this came out at that time and I'm reading this, I'd be like, what are they, ta what are they talking about? I mean, this is crazy. Um, and I mean, a lot of this is that they stared at a lot of data over many years and had got familiar with it. Um, and a lot of it is, I think, uh, in part, a uh, uh, mistake in presentation for what they did in this paper. Um, I think they could have done a better job of um, presenting this. But that, that's the result right here. And then the rest of the paper is discussing this. Right? It's just taking this as the result that says life is divided into these different kingdoms, and now let's analyze it and, and write about it. So now we get back to this SAV thing. How is this calculated, and, and why do you calculate it? Right? So that's what the other paper talks about more. That's why I wanted you in, in particular to look at the Fox et al. paper, because that paper is a little bit more about the data that was then used in this paper. OK? So if we switch to the Fox paper, they go into a little more detail on organisms. They go into a little more detail on this one weird group of organisms, the ones producing methane. Oh, by the way, nice little side story. Um, at the time, and even up until about a week ago, um, all the organisms that could produce methane were thought to be archaebacteria, or now called archaea. There's a new paper that just came out in the last couple of days saying they found bacteria that can produce methane um, through uh, nit nitrogen NIF genes, so through the nitrogenase pathway. But at the time, there was a group of organisms that produced methane. They were broadly called methanogens. It was unclear if they were all closely related to each other, or many of them were weird. They grew at high temperatures. They grew in strange conditions. So that was a lot of the focus of this Fox paper was here are the normal bacteria. Now we're going to get some data from these weird methane-producing bacteria. And we're going to try and figure out how they're related to other prokaryotes. And they go through the logic again here you know, by using uh, 16S. It's easily isolated. It's ubiquitous. It's highly constrained in sequence, et cetera. We can relate even the most distantly related microbial species to each other. And then they focus on the methanogens primarily. So here they're talking about, you know, we got these methanogens, we grew them up. Um, here's the, you know, media that we were used to grow them. Um, and then uh, part that, you know, they sort of glossed over. It's really easy to work with them and do all this work. They're feeding them P32 when they're growing because they want to radioactive label the ribosome RNA. And I'm sure that the, these labs were like, 
Geiger counter nightmares. I mean, they're just basically, if you've ever worked with organisms, you know, feeding them radioactivity when you've got them growing and shaking vials and other things in the lab, I'm sure there was radioactivity all over uh, the lab. But, you know, it's easy. Um, uh, so then they cite these papers, 13 through 17, saying how they're going to extract the 16S, analyze these digests, and, and get this data. And I assume you did not go dig into those papers, but here is basically the outline of what you do. You take your organism, either cells, or you can take tissue from a plant or animal, you grind it up, you run out the RNA, on, usually on a gel, you isolate the ribosomal RNA. Um, you either radioactively label it afterwards, which they developed largely later, or you feed your organisms radioactivity and then you get radioactively labeled ribosomal RNA. So you get it out of the cells and you do what you, it's called a digestion. So you basically um, either prepare it yourself, or you, I don't know if they could buy it at the time, that all cells, this goes back to the question about stability of RNA, all organisms have enzymes that degrade RNA. They're called RNases, ribonucleases. Um, some of them are general, they'll degrade all RNA, and some of them are specific, they'll cut RNA at specific sites of modification or specific strings of sequences, strings of letters in the RNA. So they digest it with this one particular one, T1 RNAs. I think it, uh, I'm not sure if it does exactly what its specificity is, but that was the one they focused on. And then they do what's called 2D electrophoresis, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. So they, everybody here done or know enough about gels, right? So we talked about this with sequencing. But you take your sample and you, you have wells up here. You load in the RNA into this, these wells, and you pull it through your gel matrix with like a charge. And then what you do is you, so now stuff separates by size. Or you probably just do this with one sample at a time. I shouldn't have drawn all the other. Now that I'm thinking about it. So it separates by size. And then what you do is you pull the DNA through the gel in another direction, either with a slightly different charge or you change the conditions a little bit. You add some other thing to your soak your gel in it. And then you pull the DNA, the RNA through in another direction. And you get the little bits of RNA separating by, say, charge and size or um, charge and GC frequency or some other feature. And that's why it's called two-dimensional, because you're moving the material through in one dimension and then another dimension. And what you end up with after this is a fingerprint for your organism of interest. On your 2D gel, you get spots that correspond to different fragments, little pieces of the original ribosomal RNA that you loaded into the gel. Yeah? So what you do is you pull it, you pull it through where you separate by size, and then you can do another dimension where you separate it, say, by charge, or by frequency of Cs in the DNA. All you want to do is you want to chop up your ribosomal RNA into little bitty pieces, and you want to separate those pieces from each other so that you can have a spot that corresponds to each piece of the ribosomal RNA. And the reason for that is they then cut out these spots and feed it into a reaction where they can read eight bases on one side of that sequence, basically. So they can read, you know, for one little piece, let's say it's a 50 base pair piece of RNA, they can read eight bases of that. And they do this as much as they can for every spot that they can get their hands on for this organism. And then they do it, they do the digestion again with a different RNAs, maybe, and they do this again, and they build up what's called a catalog of oligonucleotides. 
So they're short, oligonucleotides is just a short string of letters, basically. So they get this catalog of, for organism one, what is the list of the different oligonucleotides found in that organism? And now you have a table. You don't even know if, where this piece came from in the ribosome RNA. You just know that this string of letters is somewhere in that ribosome RNA. Does that make sense? It's really different than the way we do it now. Um, and so that's what they show you here. I know you can read this all really carefully. This is table one from the Fox paper. And these are the, the oligonucleotides they found in um, different organisms. So here are the oligonucleotides, they just list them. Here is U, C, 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 A, G. Here is C, U, C, C, A, G, et cetera. Then they list which organisms they find those in of their list that they're analyzing. And here they keep going. These are all the oligonucleotides that they built for their catalog, yeah. Why would you want so small? That's all they could do. The chemistry, they, they literally could not read anymore when you run the type of reaction that they were doing, the, the process that they're doing is a little um, non-specific. And so when you read the first base, it's pretty accurate. When you read the second base, now you have a little bit of error. When you read the third base, you have a little bit more error. When you read the fourth base, and by eight bases or even less on some of these reactions, that's all you could read. Yeah. So I think this sequencing process wasn't any it was, that was the pre, you know, I was saying there was this proto zero. It was one of those methods. Yeah. Um, that last column, where did those come from? Because it looks like the longer they did the Um So uh, I can't remember whether or not these represent um, things that they figured out uh, by doing sequencing from both sides of the reaction of, of a piece or if they just got lucky and it worked long. I don't remember. Most of the time, they could only get eight to 10 bases, and I'm not sure where these went. But the point is, you could build this catalog, and here's the great part of it. You could then go to another organism and build a catalog, and you don't have to, you just store the data, right? You're not comparing organisms to each other. Prior to this, and even today, a lot of the classification of bacteria is based upon an experiment where you take the DNA from bacteria one, or from microbe one, and you take the DNA from microbe two, and you hybridize them to each other, and you ask, how similar are they to each other by doing an experiment called DNA-DNA hybridization? To do that, you have to keep the DNA from all the organisms that you want to compare to each other or re-isolate the DNA. So this is a big step in microbial classification. If you can work with an organism and then just store the data and go work with the next organism and now build your table, right? This basically makes sense, what they're doing here? Okay, so now we get to the SAB uh, value. So now they say, we took this oligonucleotide catalogs and they're examined with standard clustering techniques. Um, we'll get to that uh, in, when we talk about phylogeny later. Do people know what clustering is? So clustering methods are sort of mathematical methods where you take objects, any type of object you want, and you group them by some metric of their similarity to each other. And there are hundreds of thousands of these clustering methods. And that's what they use. They use the particular form of clustering method to analyze this data. They actually first calculated this, though, this association coefficient. So the way they calculate the association coefficient is you measure the total number of nucleotides. So you take organism A and you ask what is the total number of nucleotides we have in that catalog. Take organism B and what is the total number of nucleotides we have in that catalog. And then we compare them to each other and we ask for all of the things that they have in common. All of these Whenever they have the same oligonucleotide, 
We're now going to sum up the total number of bases in that shared polygon. And we're going to then feed that into this formula where we're basically calculating, in essence, a similarity between the two of them. Right? So the number of shared over the total number summed up across the two of them. This is a standard approach for all sorts of comparative studies of organisms and of rocks and of furniture and of you know, anything else. You develop a way to compare things objectively. You calculate some measure of their similarity to each other. And then that measure of similarity is what is fed into some of these clustering methods to then group objects by their similarity. All good with this? That's then where they get this. So this is the main result number one for their paper. There are two main results in this paper, right? So this is now a table. This is one way of showing the table. Um, there are other ways where the rows correspond to the different organisms that they were looking at. So for each of these organisms, they're represented in this catalog. And then they use this formula to calculate between each pair of organisms, what is their um, similarity score. So it's in essence a percentage. It's not exactly a percentage, but it goes from zero to one, basically. You can sort of view it as a percentage. And now you produce a table that's also known as a similarity matrix that shows you these results. Right? And you stare at it for, I guess, a really long period of time. Okay? We, we got how they got here. Right? You take your organism, you grind it up, you extract ribosomal RNA, you chop up the ribosomal RNA, you run it on one of these 2D gels, you cut out parts of that 2D gel that correspond to different fragments of the ribosome RNA, you read a you know, eight to ten bases of it, and you build a gigantic table to compare between organisms. Okay, now we can go back to the Wilson Fox paper. So that's the method, which they don't describe in the Wilson Fox paper, but that's basically exactly how they got the data that they used, right? In table one, they just didn't generate it for that paper. They took data that they had stored for other organisms. And then they show you the same thing now. Um, they filled it in. Uh, so this is a symmetric table. And the other one, they just showed right one diagonal of the table. When you compare organisms to each other with that formula, it should come out to be that this, the value is the same, whether you compare wh whether organism 1 is A or organism 1 is B. That is not always the case. There are asymmetric formulas, but this one is basically a symmetric formula. They didn't have to show the other part of this um, table, but it actually makes it easier to find the groups when you're staring at the table. Okay? So this is basically that same approach. They go through, you know, they build a catalog of these associations <laughs> given by this formula. It's the same formula. Right? So you stare at this for a while and you come to the conclusion that it shows that they clearly cluster into several primary kingdoms, right? It's obvious. I, I don't know how you can't see this. Um, all right. So, however, they did do one little thing to make it easier, which is they sorted the table where the organisms that they're going to talk about, the eukaryotes, are the first three. The regular bacteria are the next six. And then this new group in the phanogens, which they're going to give a name to, um, are the next four. And they separate them a tiny little bit right, in the table. Now, if you, once you see that, it's easy, right? You can see the, it's very clear. 
All right, so they then go through and they talk about each of the different groups, right? So here's comparative analysis of the data um, shows the organism's clear cluster, but let's focus on the first. The first of these contains all of the typical bacteria characterized so far, including the genera Acetobacterium, Acinonetobacter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of weird. They only have six in this table, but they're telling you a different result than what's in the table. Um, and that's because they then cite these other papers, which also sort of already showed that. So they had a series of papers prior to these papers where they were developing this catalog method and then studying all sorts of different organisms. And until the Fox et al. paper, all of the organisms that they were looking at that were prokaryotes were normal bacteria, basically. But they could classify those once they did the methanogen paper, then they could say, well, here are the normal ones, and that's in their list here. And they fit into this group with these six that are listed here. It's a little strange to show a result that you then talk about different taxa than are in the result that you show in your paper. But um, that's OK. And this, I forget who asked it. Yeah. Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, like, uh, so this is common. Um, uh, in the 1970s, it wasn't very standardized. Today, there's sort of agreement among a lot of scientific journals with the mechanism by which you're supposed to refer to unpublished data. And it's mostly frowned upon if it's a major finding. And usually, you would try to specify now, like, which part of this is the unpublished data and which part of it is in those references. Um, but they didn't do it here. But it, it's, it's still, like if you write a paper and you have one little finding that you haven't yet included in that paper um, and you don't want to include it in the paper or you can't for some reason, you can frequently say unpublished observation. They would probably, most journals don't like this. They encourage you not to do it, but they do allow it in a diversity of journals. I, I hate it personally. I mean, I think... You should have, you should release whatever your basis is for what you're doing, but it's pretty common. Um, so then I forget who asked the gram positive and gram negative. This, um, so if you're not, you know, have, don't, not that familiar with microbes, um, microbes, bacteria have been classified for many years into two different groups, the gram positives and the gram negatives. It's based upon a stain that people do in the laboratory. So there's a um, uh, chemical method whereby you can stain this one group of organisms that stain positively with this stain. Um, and it's unclear. So, so it's similar to the prokaryote, eukaryote distinction, which is that if you look at all the, let's say these are all bacteria, some of them will stain positively with this gram stain. And it appears that the organisms that stain positively with the stain are probably closely related to each other. But that doesn't mean that the ones that don't stain with the stain are closely related to each other. Does that make sense? And it's actually really, the, most of the time when you stain positive with a gram stain, it reveals a particular feature of the structure of the outer envelope of the cell. And it turns out that that's really important for things like different types of antibiotics work differently in the different types of gram positives and gram negatives frequently. So it's a really useful feature to know, even though it's not used that much anymore as a classification scheme. Yeah? Um, that relatedness, if you have the gram positive and negative, is it clear enough to use two different classes? It is. So just, uh, we'll get to this later. But if you drew an evolutionary tree of bacteria, What you see is that there are two major groups that stain positively with the gram stain. They used to be called the high GC gram positives and low GC gram positives. They're now called the firmicutes. Those include Bacillus, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Lactococcus. They're also known as the low GC gram positives. And the actinobacteria, 
which are also known as the high GC gram positive. That includes like streptomyces, mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium leprae. And there's a few other taxa here that appear to have possibly lost the gram positive stain. So they're sort of related to each other in the middle of the group of all the other bacteria. So all of these are negative. So it doesn't mean that the gram negatives are closely related to each other. What it probably means is that the gram positive feature evolved you know, somewhere here, and then most of the descendants of that lineage now are gram positive. But it doesn't allow you any, to provide any information about the classification of the gram negatives. Does that make sense? OK, any other? OK, so now they've told you there's this one group. It's all the regular bacteria. Now if you stare at this table a lot, or what they should have done, added little boxes around their groups rather than just having the spaces, what you see is that generally, although imperfectly, the similarity scores when you look at E. coli versus Chlorobium vibrioformi, 0.24. So you can see E. coli is number four, so you can read down in this column. E. coli versus itself, it's 100% identical to itself, so it doesn't, they don't show anything. But versus Chlorobium vibrioformi, 0.24, versus Bacillus, 0.25, Corin bacterium, 0.28. I don't even know what this is, a Phanocapsa, uh, 0.26, I think that's been renamed, and a Chloroplast, 0.21. And the E. coli similarity to all the eukaryotes is much lower, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.06. And the E. coli similarity to these, this other group is also lower, right? This is where they saw, by staring at this table and sorting it by these groups, this is where they see the groupings. Does that make sense? OK, so now they go on. There's a second group defined by the 18S ribosome RNA. So um, you'll see this a lot in the literature, especially older literature. I left out this part. So when you, um, when you grind up cells, you have a culture, you grind up the cells in that, or you have a tissue sample like a leaf or a spleen or whatever, you grind stuff up and you want to get to the point where you have ribosomal RNA to do this analysis with. This was, you know, like, 30 years of work by you know, 50 people to figure out how to do this. And there are many, 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 many steps involved in the process of isolating you know, clean ribosomal RNA for this. One of the methods that people would use is what's known as performing a sedimentation gradient. You actually put the RNA and you mix it in with a sort of very dense um, sucrose material or some other material, and then you spin it in a high-speed centrifuge. It's very similar to electrophoresis, where the, it separates out the different um, molecules from each other. In this case, they're going to separate by, you know, depending on what you add to your reaction, um, by size or weight or some other feature. And when they did this, they gave them an S value when they separated out different ribosome RNAs for this. I forget, it's, I think it was the person's name who originally developed one of these methods. Um, but that S value. Um, was given a number because you would run it on one of these centrifugations and you'd record this is at you know millimeter 18 or something like that or millimeter 16 or I, I don't know exactly where the number came from and so when you did this with bacteria their ribosome RNAs came out with three different S values 5S, 16S, and 23S. When you did this with most eukaryotes they came out with, I think it was like 5.8s, 18s, and I forget what, I think this might be 28s. So the 18s for eukaryotes is actually the same, the corresponding part of the ribosome as the 16s is for bacteria. That makes sense? That's where the terminology comes from. And you will see this a lot in the literature. Here, another unpublished thing. So here, we looked at animal, plant, fungal, and slime mold unpublished. Um, very annoying in retrospect. Um, so go back to the table. They only show three things in this table for the eukaryotes, but you see basically the same 
pattern. The eukaryotes compared to each other are up here in the upper left, 0 0.29, 0 0.33, and 0.36. And if you look at the eukaryotes compared to everything else, none of the values get to that high. Right? This is a similarity score. So the more closely related organisms are, that's the model here at least, the higher the similarity score of their oligonucleotide catalog. And again, it's symmetrical. You have to look at the parts. But now it's starting. You're starting to see the groupings, right? But here's the big, this is the, the key part of the whole picture. This is it right here. Um, is, sorry, <laughs> this is not the key part. Um, that's the boring part. Um, so this is the key part of the paper, which is, OK, you have the eukaryotes. We're going to call them ur-karyotes. And they had later papers where I think they used a different definition of ur-karyotes, but let's just call them eukaryotes and ignore that. But um, here's the key part. Prokaryote versus eukaryote does not constitute, con constitute a dichotomy. They do not collectively exhaust the class of living systems. Right? That is, there's another group. So here's the key part. There exists a third kingdom which to date, is represented solely by the methanogenic bacteria. So they're still calling them bacteria in this part of the paper. That's what they were known as. They were unusual in that they produced methane. That's what, why people first started working on them. And the Fox et al. paper showed that the methanogens were somewhat different from the other bacteria. They didn't include the eukaryotes in that paper. But they said the methanogens were somewhat different from the other bacteria. And here is where they're now questioning the naming, right? These bacteria um, appear to be no more related to typical bacteria than they are to eukaryotic cytoplasms. Why do they say cytoplasm? Yeah, so they're, they're trying to distinguish your mitochondria and chloroplasts, which they don't talk about it that much, but um, Chloroplasts and mitochondria actually used to be bacteria. They actually have their own ribosomes and their own ribosomal RNA, and you can classify them in the same way. And they included one of them here, chloroplast. OK, so now here's the figure with all the groups highlighted, right? So if you look at the methanogens now, here are their scores with each other. They're more similar to each other than they are to either bacteria or eukaryotes. Right? That is the, this is now the key finding of the paper, is that if you take samples from across the living organisms, they haven't included everything in this, fig, in this table, but they tell you you know, unpublished data or, you know, cite previous papers that everything else fits this pattern, which is that there are three groupings rather than two groupings. And then they start talking about, you know, what this might mean. And then they say, we're going to name this the Archae bacteria. And they pick that name poorly. Um, first of all, they really should not have included bacteria as part of the name. They're telling you they're not bacteria. It's amazing. And then they include bacteria as part of the name. So years later, they wrote another paper. Um, Wos and some other people uh, wrote another paper saying, get rid of the archaea bacteria, get rid of the bacteria part. We're now going to call them archaea. Turns out that was not the best name either, because the archaea part was supposed to refer to like the primitive earth, because they were thinking the methanogens growing at these high temperatures, producing methane with weird metabolism. They're somehow reflective of organisms that lived in the ancient past on you know, primitive Earth. Turns out there are plenty of archaea that are not methanogen. There are many that live in places that are your gut, you know, the ocean surface waters, in normal places. And yet the, name, the archaea part of the name still sticks around. It's OK. Um, that basically makes sense, what's going on here? So then they say, table one shows these three. Now they gave it a new name, right? This is also the ur thing. 
We're going to call these the Ur kingdoms, like the super kingdoms. Later on in that paper where they proposed renaming it from Archaebacteria to Archaea, they also said we should call these something else. They came up with a new term called the domain. So now we have three major domains of life. Bacteria, eukaryotes, and archaea. And they say in here, okay, now they're going to talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about primarily in the next class, which is because the distance measured are actually proportional to number of mutations and not necessarily time, it cannot be proven that the three lines of descent branch from a common ancestral line at about the same time. So what they're saying here is they're now going from this classification to phylogeny, right? They're saying, we are saying there are three, you know, Ur kingdoms, but we may call them domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. But what we don't know from this is the order of branching of them over history. That is, if we drew an evolutionary tree, all they're saying is that there are three main branches in the evolutionary tree, and we don't know if bacteria and archaea share a common ancestor with each other to the exclusion of eukaryotes, or if archaea and eukaryotes share a common ancestor with each other to the exclusion of bacteria, or if bacteria and eukaryotes share a common ancestor to the exclusion of archaea. Then we can't figure that out. because the distances don't tell us that. So I, this is a pretty important point. Um, for this uh, paper, so what was this based on? This was based on almost entirely just looking at this distance matrix, uh, this similarity matrix, right? So what they're saying is that when we take the ribosome RNA, grind it up, extract it, centrifuge it, whatever, run it on these 2D gels, read the sequence of these little pieces, build an ol oligonucleotide catalog and compare them to each other and calculate this S-score, that that measure is measuring what they're calling mutational differences. So if you have two organisms that are you know, very similar to each other and they differ by one base in their ribosome RNA, they should have an incredibly high S-score. You might not even find it depending on which ribosomal RNA pieces you were able to sequence. And if organisms are really distantly related, they should have a low S score. But what they're saying is that that score is not necessarily proportional to time. And the reason for this is organisms evolve at different rates. So one organism might accumulate a lot of differences with its close relative in a short period of time if its mutation rate is high. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, does the, uh, the different strains of bacteria affect the ribosomal RNA? The two strains of the same species have slightly different ribosomal RNA sequences? Uh, they can and do. Um, it's uh, ribosomal RNAs mostly in, in the coding region of the ribosomal RNA, mostly are very, very constrained evolutionarily. And so when a mutation happens within a population, usually it's selected against, right? And so, and there's also processes that homogenize. So, so many, most organisms have multiple copies of ribosomal RNA gene within the species. And they get homogenized within the species so that they look identical to each other. So if you have an in it, and then the cells divide, right, and the daughter cells, one of the daughter cells gets a mutation in it and another doesn't. Most of the time, the other six copies will wipe out that, first, that mutation in the first one. And you don't have a lot of diversity within a population. Um, because it sort of slows down the evolutionary rate in a way by doing that. Um, but eventually, you can accumulate a, a difference. And that can be within a species. It's just because selection also is operating on this, where so the ribosomal RNA, if you remember the diagram, it's inside this structure where it has to fold over on itself. And then it has to get put inside the ribosome, which has like 30 proteins in it, and other RNA molecules. And they have you know, a very important function. 
there's m incredible selection against changes. So changes happen over evolutionary time, but they arise very slowly because most of the changes that occur get the leaf, get the popular, those cells die, or those organisms die. So there are polymorphisms within populations. They're just usually subtle, or a couple of one base, two bases, and they're usually, um, they accumulate slowly. In fact, the reverse problem is more of a problem. You can have two organisms that most people consider different species that can have identical 16S ribosome RNA. It evolves that slowly. That, yeah. Okay. So here's this thing. They drew this distance matrix. They didn't even show you on the distance matrix where the different groups were. Um, they talk about this discovery of a third branch in the tree fly. What could they have done differently? Is there another way to view this data? Yeah. Yeah, why did the way didn't they draw a tree? It's crazy. It is stark, <laughs> raving, mad, crazy. And I don't under, I, I wish I had, so Woos died a few years ago. Um, I really wish I had asked him about this. George Fox is, I think, still alive. I'm not sure um, if he's still alive. But I really am curious why what was the decision that led them to not show a tree? I'm sure they thought about it. I'm sure there was a reason. They didn't want to get into an argument, probably, with people about the structure of the tree. But it would have helped to show a tree. So let's go back to the other paper, right? So here's the other paper, which they published before this one. Here's the matrix. You can stare at the matrix all you want and try and come up with that the methanogens, you know, you can sort of see. Here are all the methanogens. They're more similar to each other than any are to these other things. Maybe here's, you know, the formula. Um, sorry, and they talk about this matrix um, was used to generate a dendrogram by average linkage clustering. So this is one of the 100,000 different clustering methods where you can take data um, and, and draw a, what's called a dendrogram. So it, we'll talk about in the next class, it's not quite an evolutionary tree, but it's showing the groupings of organisms. And they say this too. They say the resulting dendrogram is not strictly a phylogenetic tree, um, but it's a grouping of organisms. And you can see in this tree, here's you know, the main methanogen group, here's a second methanogen group, and here are the regular bacteria. So in this, the way they draw it, there are two big branches of prokaryotes. I think it would have helped to draw a tree for this other paper. But I, again, I don't know why they didn't do it. They just show this. Um, uh, oh, so we will, I will, um, after the next class, when we talk about some of these methods, I'm going to, one of your assignments will be to build a tree from this data. Um, and I'll give you the you don't have to type in the matrix. I'll give you this matrix, and we'll talk about um, how you might be able to build a tree from that. Um, I'm not going to show you what the tree looks like. This, a few years later, Woese wrote this review paper where he did now show a tree. Um, and this was sort of the big, you know, what he was trying to, in essence, say in that other paper. But this certainly is a nice visual way of representing it. So this is what's known as an unrooted evolutionary tree. How many people do not know what an unrooted tree is? OK, so um, there are two different ways of drawing evolutionary trees. One is a rooted tree, which is sort of the most, I'm so cool. Um, <laughs> a rooted tree is the most sort of familiar and obvious way to draw a tree, where you have a branch leading up to the common ancestor of all the organisms you're showing in the tree. This is known as the root branch in the tree. And then you draw the bifurcation events, splits, that represent the origin of different lineages in your evolutionary tree. So if you were trying to draw, um, you know, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, um, or let's do humans, chimps, and gorillas. Gorillas, 
humans and chimps. This is showing that humans and chimps share a more recent common ancestor with each other than either does with gorillas. And here is the common ancestor of the entire group. So this is the root branch leading up to the common ancestor of humans, chimps, and gorillas. It's a rooted tree. Unrooted trees are used largely when you don't know where the root is. And we'll get to, when we talk about phylogeny, why you wouldn't necessarily know where the root is. But what you do to convert a rooted tree into an unrooted tree is you get rid of um, the root branch. And you now unwind the tree where you're not saying which of these nodes in the tree represents the common ancestor of the entire group. So you would unwind this. to a tree that looks like this. And what this is basically saying is that we have three groups, and we don't know how they're related to each other, per se. But you could add on to this. You could say all of the chimpanzees share a common ancestor with each other to the exclusion of these other groups, basically. Or in this unrooted tree, or at least more close to each other. And all the gorilla lineages are over here. This is the equivalent to that tree. So what you don't know here is where the root branch comes in. The root branch could come in here. And then I would say the humans and gorillas, if you unwind this now, you would have this root branch is here. Here's this node. And then you have a branch leading the chimps and a separate branch leading to the common ancestor of humans and gorillas. The root node can come in here. The root node can come in there. It actually can come in the middle of this group here. So an unrooted tree, you can't infer from an unrooted tree which thing is the common ancestor of other things and which groups are sister, you know, related taxa to each other. Gives you an overall picture of the sort of distances between different organisms. And that's what this shows. Does that basically make sense? So I think this is why they didn't show the tree. Because they have three groups. They don't know the order of branching among those groups. They would have to draw an unrooted tree to show that correctly. And people just didn't do that at the time very much. And it would have, I think, confused people if they had tried to explain this in their paper. And they just wanted to stick to there were three groups. So they do make one inference that is actually not technically correct. So they infer from this, from their distant similarity matrix and from this tree, that all the archaebacteria share a common ancestor with each other to the exclusion of the other groups. That is, if we change this to the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, they are saying when they the rest of the text in the paper, when they talk about what are the common features among archaea. And how did they evolve? What are the common features among eukaryotes and the common features among bacteria? They are assuming that the root branch does not go into the middle of one of these groups. That is not the smartest assumption to make, but they made that assumption. So then the rest of the paper is about why this is interesting. Why is it interesting that there are three groups rather than two? What can we learn by looking at the features of these groups and say about the evolution of life on this planet? And the reason it's you know, extra interesting is that you know, all the previous trees of life either invented something for the microbes with no data, or 
made this mistake of saying that the absence of a feature should tell you how related organisms are. And now what they're saying is we actually can study the relatedness of all organisms on the planet objectively with data that we can compare between all these different groups. So that's what the rest of the paper is about. <laughs> you know, um, the phenotype of the methanogens, although ostensibly bacterial, that is, they look a lot like bacteria, but on close scrutiny, doesn't give any indication of a close relatedness to bacteria. And now they go through some of that discussion. They have cell walls, like bacteria, but they don't contain peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is, uh, you know, was thought before people started to work on the methanogens to be a hallmark feature of prokaryotes that help distinguish them from eukaryotes. But now they're saying, here's at least one group of this new branch, the archaea, that does not have peptidoglycan in their cell wall. So now what they're doing is, it would be, imagine if you went, um, you know, you were the first person to ever study non-human primates. And you started to collect data about them. And all you had was, you know, a sample of hair from different non-human primates from lots of places on the planet. And you're trying to connect that sample of hair, and that's all you could, you didn't, you couldn't see what they looked like. And you had all this other data like physiology and behavior and other things, but you still couldn't classify them. Pretty confusing to start to try and make sense out of it. But if you knew that the samples from this one forest were chimpanzees and the samples from this one place were gorillas, you could start to make more sense out of the biological observations you make of those organisms. Now you have 10 gorilla samples and 50 chimpanzee samples. You now start to say, well, what do the chimpanzees have in common with each other and so on? That's what they're doing here. They're saying, oh my God, we actually can figure out that these organisms are not normal prokaryotes. Let's look at them more carefully. God, we were stupid. They have all these weird features and we basically glossed over this because we lumped everything together as prokaryotes. So here they just list some of these features in this paper that are you know, unique in one of these groups compared to the other two groups. So something unique in one of the groups is also by default shared by the other two groups. That's basically what they're doing now. Um, talking about these examples. That, any questions about that? Yeah. So are they just moving uh, up this new group based on the fact that they don't have a bill of them? No, the grouping is based upon this. Or no, I mean that observation though. The observation is now trying to make sense out of this though, right? They're not grouping organisms by peptidoglycan. and they're saying, well, this is interesting. These organisms here, which appear to be a new group that we never knew about before, they also don't have peptidoglycan. Right? It's a, it's not, they're not grouping them by the presence and absence of peptidoglycan. Does that make sense? The grouping came from this data. They're now taking that grouping and saying, are there any features that are consistent with this grouping? Does that make sense? What? It's like a confirmation. Yeah, in a way, it's a confirmation thing. Although, um, it's biased by right. I mean, it, it. There may be other features that they don't share in common that they're not reporting on here. Yeah. In this paper, did they already make findings on the membrane structure and difference between archaea and? <coughs> um, not a lot in the other paper. I think they hint at that a tiny bit, but so um, once this finding came out, lots of people then went and said, can we then do experiments to ask, are there any other features that all bacteria share in common to the exclusion of archaea, for example? So that is asking about these grouping, given these groupings, can we find anything else in common? And I think the membrane difference that has been observed in many of the archaea, but not all of them, 
was found after this paper. I'm not, I'm not actually sure about that. Okay, so then they talk about one other thing, um, or a couple of other things in the paper. They say, okay, so now we ground up a bunch of cells, tissue samples, we did this oligonucleotide catalog, we built a table but not a tree, um, and we found three groupings. Is there a fourth? I mean, why shouldn't there, why should there be only three? I mean, that just seems silly, and they, argue against it. So they say, um, as seen above, the number of species that can be classified as eubacteria, those are the true bacteria, they came up with this name, which now has also gone away, um, is moderately large. They actually don't show that in the table. That's that list that then reference unpublished data and a bunch of papers. But we're gonna just grant them that that's true. And then they say, here's another, um, they must have added this after their paper was written. To this list can be added spirillum and desulfovibrio. Um, and they reference this one paper, a new paper. Um, and they say, because this list is also phenotypically diverse, it seems unlikely that many, if any, of the yet uncharacterized groups will be shown to have <laughs> co-equal status with the group presented here. This is ridiculous. I mean, the, the amount of microbial life that had been sampled when they did this paper is like one-tenth of a half of a tenth of a hundredth of a thousandth of a percent. I mean, it is just completely crazy that they did this, actually. Um, it looks like they may be right, but it's still <laughs> completely wacky that they did this. Um, and now they, they say, you know, at the end here, maybe, it's ridiculous, but maybe, um, the halophiles, you know, might be a candidate for having a fourth branch in the tree. So, and that's based upon the cell wall. I, again, I don't think they had membrane data, but that's based upon not having peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Turns out they then wrote papers later saying halophiles fit into this third branch. They're not a fourth branch. They're archaea, um, and they fit in quite well with the methanogen group. And then they talk about, you know, what are eukaryotes and where do chloroplasts and mitochondria um, come from, and they talk about the endosymbiotic theory. We're not going to you know, focus a lot on that. Um, and they basically then say, OK, so now we have this. What can we say about, if we have a rooted tree, what can we say about what the common ancestor of everything was like? So they don't know the order of branching here, right? They don't know if the tree looks like this. Are they all sort of evolved at the same time? Or like this, with archaea and eukaryotes sharing a common ancestor? Or with archaea and bacteria, or with bacteria and eukaryotes? They don't know the structure of the tree. And they ask, can we say something about what the common ancestor looked like, even though we don't know that? Um, and they say probably, you know, probably not. Um, um, and then they talk about different theories for how you could come up with, in particular, the eukaryotic structure with all these weird things inside the cell, nucleus, organelles, etc. either with that being sort of ancestral or with that being a new feature. That's the rest of the paper, basically. And then you can read the abstract. Um, so, um, I mean, this is, I mean, it's probably, I would argue this is the single most important paper in the history of microbiology. Um, it just, it may not be perfectly true, as we will see when we talk about metagenomic analysis. The modern view of the tree of life is starting to suggest that maybe um, what they classified as archaea for many years, it's possible that eukaryotes actually evolved from the middle of the archaeal group. Confusing, but we'll get to that. Um, but it doesn't matter whether or not they were perfectly accurate. What they did was basically say, we have a way of objectively studying the relatedness among 
organisms that previously were not really classified well or their evolutionary history was also done somewhat poorly. And then after this came out, for the next 20 years, as we will see a couple of papers on, people then said, okay, I'm going to do ribosomal RNA analysis of this and this and this and this. And you know, half of those papers would say, oh my god, our classification sucked. Um, here's so Pseudomonas, for example. There were many things grouped as pseudo called Pseudomonas based upon largely phenotypic features. I think in the end, the things originally called Pseudomonas come from like a hundred different genera. Um, and there's also things, chlamydia and rickettsias used to be grouped together because they're phenotypically similar. Chlamydia are in their own phylum. Rickettsias are a subgroup of the group that is related to the mitochondrial ancestor. So you see over the next 20 years just this series of paper after paper after paper after paper saying, we're going to take the same approach, infer our relatedness, and oh my god, we were completely wrong. And this goes back to your question about the peptidic lichen. And then they say, now let's look at the features of these organisms with this tree. Oh my god.